I'm going to guess you had another career before this de- DJing. I had many careers before DJing. So, so, so. I had the, the first job I ever had, I absolutely hated. I was a management trainee um, working for the Cooperative Wholesale Society. And I was trained in personnel and industrial relations, what they now call human resources. But um, I was you know, kind of interned at lots of different parts of the factory. So I was in food manufacturing group one week and retail retail for three months and travel for three months and banking for three months. I hated that job. I hated it. I hated it with every fibre of my being, but I was good at it. I was good at it. You know, I I managed to write a training programme for 60 branches of a car hire and travel company when I was 18 years old, you know, so I was gifted. I could do it, but I just hated the environment. I'm just not really a very good... I have to admit to myself, you have to admit... um, your failings and your weak points and your Achilles heels. And I'm not really very good in offices. I don't enjoy the environment. I don't enjoy the politics. I don't enjoy the bitchiness. I just, it's just not me. Like, I just don't enjoy it. So I didn't, I didn't stick with that. I did the two years for the course. And then at the the end of the two years, I got a job working for Piccadilly Radio as a junior reporter and I got another job working with them as the record librarian so I was like that's me I knew I wanted to work in music and it was like this is it I'm going to be in radio and that was my first job in radio and I left working in an office and it all seemed like it was going to be fa- fabulous until I found myself working in a massive big record library with no windows and one door, which <laughs> if if you want to be re- rendered insane, I do, I do recommend that. <laughs> I recommend. But if you don't want to be sent slowly insane, find an office with a window (laughs) don't be in the dark (laughs) don't be in the dark you just feel like a potato and you will go slowly crazy which i did and um i lasted probably about seven months in the record library and then it was just like no no this isn't for me either so then i went back into travel i managed a branch of a car hire company and then i worked in advertising for two years i was a copywriter for two years that was a bit better because i'm a writer i love it you know um and then i went and did my degree in english and it was while i was studying for my degree in english that i started clubbing again and I found the Hacienda. I found oh. myself at the Hacienda. And DJing paid my way through my degree. It paid for my degree. Oh, really? Well, it paid for my studies. Of course it did. I earned a fortune. <laughs> I think I was the richest I've ever been, relatively, um, from 1992 to 94. I had cash coming out of my pockets it was mental (laughs) I was so rich it was mental Uh, because I was working probably three times a week and and I was traveling I was DJing and I didn't have any responsibilities I was just you know paying my rent and everything else was gravy and it was amazing Um, and I was also presenting a tv program at the same time so I was loaded it was amazing (laughs) TV program were you in? I had I was a co-presenter on a TV program called Juice, which was produced by uh, a woman called Janie Valentine um, on Granada TV for 1992 to 93, and we did another series, I think 93 to 94. Yeah, we did. We did two different sets for shows. It was amazing. It paid a lot of money. It bought me, that TV show bought me my decks. Okay, That's so how I bought my decks. The TV show got you the decks. Yeah. 
Because uh, I had thousands of pounds doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and the t- and the DJing helped you pay the and the DJing paid me to pay college. college. Yeah. Can you yeah. share with us what it would have cost it back then to go to school? Um not very much not as much as it does now because um but, but, in but, but well, because in ninety two, in in ninety, let's say, I did my degree ninety one to ninety four, and and in those days, we got it for free, so we didn't have to pay for uh, a yearly annual fee for our studies. So we just paid for our books and paid for our rent. Obviously, you know, our sure. Key. But sure. the actual educational side of it we didn't have to pay for that in those years so it didn't really it didn't really cost me. it cost me the price of my books <laughs> did that change in england now did yeah it's changed pay? you have to pay every year i think oh. it's minimum nine thousand pounds a year minimum nine when did that change how long after you were there remember quite a long time after i left Actually, I think it was in the 2000s when it was brought in that people oh. paid for their studies. And it, you know, it caused a big hoo-ha, but now people are used to it. But, you know, that that's, you know, we got the American system of ed- education where you pay for your studies. Now but I, I didn't. Them. I was free. <laughs> she, you don't want everyone, she's dating herself. <laughs> So clubbing happens, DJing happens. You get your yeah. degree, of course. Your degree is locked in. You pay off everything. Yeah, and I was very lucky to be in Manchester at, at, at a time when, um, you know, post Ray, post the Summer of Love, I was in a city where the, you know, the 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 key club we had was like one of the best clubs in the world. You know, the Hacienda was bringing all the American DJs in on the Saturday True. night. And the Friday night was the nude party with Dave Haslam and Mike Pickering. And the Saturday was Graham Park. And the party that I played was called Flesh. And it was once a month every, you know, I think it was the last Wednesday. I'm looking at the poster. Yeah, last Wednesday of every month. And I did that for like four years. And I hosted the second room there. And I was lucky enough to be in Manchester when that club was one of the best clubs in the world. The pinnacle. The pinnacle one of the best clubs in the world. Yeah. And from there, I just, you know, I, I moved from the Hacienda to having a weekly residency at the Zap Club in Brighton. And I took that because Carl Cox had the Friday night. I had the Saturday night weekly. And I when I went to Brighton, then I got the um, guest spots at the Ministry of Sound and Heaven. And then from there, it just kind of <sighs> exploded. Well, let me ask you now this uh, thing I'm thinking about. Since your mom was a hard worker, hmm. were you also juggling to all this with something else or you were just totally into music at this point? Well, I made a decision to follow music, but I always did two jobs. So I was either a TV researcher and a DJ or I was a publicist and a DJ. And for many years... The publicity, you know, I was a press officer for Mercury Records from 94 to 98, the end of 98. And that's when I worked for Talking Loud. That's when I worked for Manifesto Records. That's when I worked for Def Jam and and uh, did quite a lot of award-winning stuff for them. So, yeah, I have got the same work ethic as my mum. I think I don't work anywhere near as hard as she did because I haven't got kids. But um, 
yeah, all my sisters have the same work ethic as my mom. I could tell. I could tell just listening to it. So, of course, now you're also working corporate and underground. So you're doing mm. what I call overground and underground. You work mm. in both sides of the stick. Mm. Um, where's the big break really come for you, you know, along this way? Because I remember we spoke about the two doors and then you had decisions that had to be made. Yeah, well, it did. It came when I was doing studying for my degree because when I was studying for my degree, again, you know, I did my degree be in, in English because I wanted to study English. I love reading. I love the English language. And, and sure. I wanted to teach. And I was going to do a master's in it. Oh, really? And that's the way it was going. And I wanted to teach um, at degree level, so 18 plus. And it was going that way. I... It was really going that way. But then I was working at the Hacienda. I didn't plan to DJ at all. I totally fell into it. But I fell into doing something that I realized that I was really good at. And I had a choice. I ha I remember very clearly having a meeting with um, my like my mentor, like the professor that was kind of helping me through my degree. And and at the end of it, we had a meeting where I said, oh, you know, I really want to study for an MA. And she made a comment which really kind of put a seal on me finishing my education because she said, you know, if you go and do your MA, um, you'll get onto the course straight away because, you know, you're a black woman. And that kind of bounced me out because I thought I don't want to do an MA just because, you know, I don't want to get through just because, you know, on a numbers thing because I'm black. I want to do it because I'm good at it. And she kind of told me the wrong thing. And that made me change my mind about the direction I was going in. And I thought, you know, I just want to do what I love and what I'm good at. And music took over. So let me ask this very poignant question. Mm -hmm. Any regrets going forward making the decision of being the DJ over being the MA? No. No. I mean, I, I think maybe last year, I, yeah, maybe last year I would have. I knew it. I'm going to say it quietly. I knew it. Because I thought a little bit about. Because you're in solitary teaching. confinement, right? And, and. Teaching was one of those jobs that didn't stop. It still rolled. You know, they, they were teaching online and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and maybe there was a little bit of, you know, at the back of my mind, I thought, you know, if I had have done my MA, everything would have been so much easier for me this year. But other than that, no. No. But I want to say that to everybody again. Remember when you were all at home, looking yourselves in the mirror, thinking, what the hell was I thinking? Mm. Staying in the music industry or being an actor or whatever we are, you know, mm. working in event planning, whatever we do in this thing of music, okay? Mm. Uh, solitary confinement makes you think that way. Like, what an yeah. idiot I was taking the the easy way, you know, not the easy way. Because music yeah. is not easy. This is music a tough is not job. easy. This is a tough job. <laughs> yeah, this is crowd, not the easy time. Right? Well, tell them how hard is this job that we work in? Tell them. Absolutely not. Because I don't know what people think looking in on it, but when you're looking out, I know the hours that I spend listening to music I know the hours that I spend 
getting my set and my sound right. I know the time I spend um, connecting with people, building relationships, that kind of thing. All the things that you can't actually see that happen, you know, even just in terms of digitizing your music and putting it on a key, all of that takes time. Selecting your music takes time. Buying your music takes time. And you have to be so focused about it. Yeah. And you have to be really kind of single minded about this being what you want to do and how you want to live your life. And then, you know, for yourself, production, how do you fit that in? How do you fit your radio show in? How do you fit this podcast into your week of you your don't, you don't normal fit in. life? You make it work. You don't, you don't, don't fit in. Life. Fit in. You don't. Uh, how do you fit how do you fit your dentist appointment into your life? You know, how do you fit your doctor's appointment, your hospital appointment, and your radio show and your podcast and your record label? You have to, you know, it's a job but like wait, any other. Wait. It's not a hobby. Hold it's on. a job. But wait, everyone's, but, but, but that's music. You don't work. You know, you, 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 <laughs> you don't work. Oh, no. It just happens. It's like a smoke. It just happens. It just falls in your lap like a box of chocolates. Well, guess what? (laughs) I hate to ruin. I I, I hate. I hate to, um, you know, ruin your ideas of music being an easy life or an easy option it is not an easy life it's not an easy option everybody I know in this industry everyone I know in the creative industry works super super hard they are not it if you want to do music as a hobby sure go ahead that is an easy thing you know hobbyist where you can dip in and dip out of it But as soon as you make that decision, as soon as you make that commitment to it being your life and your career, then everything else has to move out of the way. Because even if you think of the way we work, we work very antisocial hours. So the days when we're, or the nights when we're working, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, are when everybody else has the time off. So when all your friends want to go out and socialize, you're working, you know, so that it's the, it's the land of the big compromise. And I'm not play, I don't do pity parties. I don't do tiny violins either. I really couldn't care less, but you know, I'm not asking for anyone to feel sorry for anyone that works in the music industry, but I'm just asking people to understand that it's not an easy option everyone that I know who does this is in there like down to the last molecule and serious and committed and possibly some of the hardest working people that I know. So no. So basically everybody, what she's trying to say is everyone is grinding. Yeah. To the point where where oil is no longer in the engine, the metal is grinding. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Like we that. we grind even when there's nothing lubricating. <laughs> yeah, that grinding. sounds filthy, but it was meant to. But <laughs> no, it just, it just anybody knows that a, a mechanical engine without oil in it and and it running yeah. is a basic cease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we can make it run even when there isn't anything. That's that's part of the magic of what makes it. Disney in a way, mm. you know, we come up and dream up these great ideas and, and we try to execute them. That's you the know? magic. That's the magic. That's the magic. Like any performer, even the singer, songwriter, actress, you name it. That's the magic. That's the illusion that you have to I think people have to realize that there's a lot of smoke and mirrors that goes on with music, that what you see you know, that thing that you see at the absolute end result, there's so much behind it. 
there's so much more work that goes on behind it and um yeah that's the magic i think that's why we do it though isn't it we totally it's making dreams come true every day yeah and the hard the hard part of this of this game is and i call it a game is that to stay in the game yeah relevant how do you stay relevant for th nearly 30 years oh that's what we're gonna ask you now you know here we go we you know you 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 started djing you know oh and by the way you said the djing found you yeah it did in the days that it found you you started with vinyl correct yes i did how did you learn how to play the blending part of it, the mixing, did anyone show you or you were just no. a man talent? No, no, nobody showed me anything. I didn't, you know, I really wish, you know, if I went back in time, really, if I went back in time, I would, I would very definitely ask for help. I would very definitely ask for guidance. And I would very definitely ask somebody to show me how to do it because why? I didn't have anyone. I didn't have anyone. I didn't, nobody told me how to do any of this. I had to just figure it out for myself. And when I started DJing, I didn't even have my own decks. So for the first two years, <laughs> and this is quite funny, for the first two years, figuring out how to use the equipment at work, I was at home with um, not even like, not even the techniques. I had a record player. I had two record players and I used to put a track on one turntable and then I'd put, I didn't even have a mixer. So I'd put another track on the second turntable and I just used to, with my finger, try and get, the times right so I could stop stop one and start the next one in time and I tried to figure it out like that it is almost impossible it's not impossible but it's almost impossible and then when I got my techniques then and a uh, I think, did I get a Gemini two-channel mixer to start with? It was just basic with a punch in, punch out, and and all of that. It was very, very basic. But then I kind of taught myself how to beat, match, and mix. Nobody showed me how to do it. Nobody even told me what to do with my reaction sheets from the record labels. And I'd started to receive. Oh, wait, a minute, wait, 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 wait. Hang on. Hang on, darling. Let me let me clarify. You you're not completely coming in zero. No, this I did. I came in as a as a as a as here's a the thing. You had musical training. Yes. So you understand measures. Yes. Beat, you understood yes. the basics yes. of all that. So it wasn't yes. like you were a, a, ki a kid that just said, here, go go find your turntables and throw some records on. So you kind of understand rhythm. You danced. You played in the bands. Yeah, yeah. I forgot to say I was a singer as well for many, oh, many years. I'm sorry. Yeah. So she understood how to sing too. So she yeah. she knew phrasing. She, she understood. Yeah. So it was a matter of basically the mechanics of the structure of getting the beats to overlay yeah. and sense, correct? Yeah, it was the equipment. I I had to learn the equipment, the technology, the the technology that was available to me in 92. And it was, you know, it wasn't anything like what we have now. It wasn't anything like as advanced. Well, I mean, as there was no sync button on the on the deck. It was like <laughs> Children, there was no such thing. No such thing. That's Either you mix thing. it or you don't. Either you crash the mix or you don't. You know, you, trucks you know. crashing in the night. That's what it like. <laughs> you know, you know, it's got what we call in England we called it galloping horses, and in the French you'd say "ça met les cacahuètes en l'air." You know, it throws the peanuts in the air. So you know that, that you say trucks crashing in the yeah, dance floor. It's yeah. what it sounds like. Pra, 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 yeah, pra. It's like yeah. 
beats get further and further. It's like, it's like, and then you do it just by listening to, listening to people who are and were really super good at mixing vinyl. So I listened to a lot of Frank Knuckles and, um, you know, because Larry Levan came kind of after before I started DJing. CJ so McIntosh was it really was, good. CJ playing. was very good at CJ it. CJ was really good at um, the beats um, down. Paul Trouble Anderson was incredible. And these were the people that I followed and instinctively went and learned and saw and watched what they did. And, and uh, you know, Danny Crivet, brilliant. And who else? Louis, Louis Vega, you know, just just incredible beat matches. Even Roger Sanchez, three decks. Carl Cox, three, four decks going at the same time. You know, so I, I'd i watch, I'd go and I'd watch. And I, you know, for me, even getting two decks to <laughs> go at the same, you know, to sync up right was like result. Um, but I just went clubbing a lot and i learned from watching and didn't listening you feel, didn't you feel like when you were clubbing at that time that you felt like you were above everyone else in the sense of you knew you were listening intently to the records and the mixing more than just hanging out drinking it's different yeah yeah, yeah. you felt like yeah. you felt like you were part of an elite crew of people well, like, yeah. like an artsy type of way of looking at it you know well i don't even think it is part of it i i don't think i ever even thought of it like that i i don't think it put myself above i think i think it put myself in a group of people who actually didn't listen to people when they were talking because they were listening to the music. <laughs> right. I don't think it put me above anything. It, it kind of Oh, you know what I mean? You're so, you know, your, your target zone is, oh my God, that record, I got to find out that record. Yeah. And not talking yeah. about some nonsense, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I was following records. I was following DJs. I was following sounds and styles and genres and, and starting to figure out in my head where I fit into where my sound fit into in that you know in that spectrum and then I started getting a lot of UK bookings and international bookings and that in itself starts to shape how you do and but how your does sound the fame, is and okay. how you perform. before you jump into the fame how does the fame begin for you because everyone has that starting point to get to that fame where the door cracks open it it started in Manchester though because I was on TV, so I ah, was more uh, I was a personality bullshit. at the same time as I was DJing. So it, it, it I kind of had a bit of heat on me, fame already, fame in that way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you were in the early part of what I would call the early part of social media. In a sense, I hate to use it, but it is an example. It's People, when you're on TV, this is before Big Brother and all that mm -hmm. stuff. She was already a presenter. Mm -hmm. So a presenter makes her a famous yeah. person regionally in the area, but it's yeah. enough to kickstart. Well, it did. It meant yeah. that I could, it meant that I pretty much worked at every club in Manchester. See? Boardwalk, Green Room, State. I did, you know. Now I'm I gonna did. give you. I'm gonna compliment you. Ready? Mm. The girl can play. No, no <laughs> bullshit. Now here's the deal. This I is the I'm club really. scene. Now, now here's the girl can play. She knows I know that. Now, here's the, deal. <laughs> the deal is this: she could have been a crap DJ. And that's not what I'm saying. But because she was on that little screen in the house. Yeah. They wanted her in that club because they knew she would draw those people in. Yeah. It's like a magnet. But here's the funny part. The girl could play music for real. Yeah. That's and that's a compliment to you. It's not like I'm, you know, trying to take that away yeah. from you. 
Yeah. You know, she she can dance. She can. She knew how to. She knew how to select the right music. I can and dance. That, I can select. I. She can I sing, think select, for me, dance. for me, it's the selection has always been the key. But I'm not. I'm not a super snobby. DJ, I play to make people dance. I'm a dancer. Before I was a DJ, I was a singer and I was a dancer. So I very much play with that mentality. I like vocals and I like the sort of music that, you know, brings you out of yourself. You're the happy, the big, big happy. the records make you smile from big, the that, that, that just give you that swell. It doesn't necessarily have to even be happy because I can play dark tech like till the cows come home but it just has to you know just press on you press on that nerve I like to find that nerve I do, I just really like to find that little sweet spot and I like to turn up the heat I like to take people on a journey as well I like long sets as well I like playing long sets and I can do short sets you know I started off playing long sets four five six hours that's that was my training so you know when you get given a two hour set then you just go like boom <laughs> and play, and by, the play. Time you, by the time you get the first sweat on the brow it's time to shut it down yeah yeah. I just tell everybody, I'm just about ready to get really heated. Yeah, I'm just into it now, and I've got to And go. it's like somebody just pulled <laughs> the cord and shut it down. Yeah. Shut it down. Yeah. 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 I love music, though. I just love where it can take you, you know, as many records as I can play. You know, uh, it will remind you of where you were, what car you had, what clothes you were driving. And i that's the magic of music. And I i try to you know with with the sets i play particularly when i'm playing a um an old school set or if i'm playing a, a brunch set or a mix it up set i like to play those tunes that make people or put people in that situation where they can remember where they were when they first heard it or they can remember who they were with or you know that take them on that little nostalgic journey but bring them back into the present as well you know because that's the magic of music and that's the key reason why we all do this mm. and i talked about this many times that that endorphin levels will never be there's no drug in the world like playing music the satisfaction Even, that you get from it is incredible you know, just last night i had a bit of a moment i went to bed probably about midnight and my I was overthinking I was overthinking about something about the weekend travel whatever and I couldn't sleep and I just slept out of bed I had a song in my head why this song popped into my head I don't know it's Asaf Avidan the track is called Little Parcels of Endless Time and I got up found my phone, played it on my phone, and then looked at the lyrics of the track as the, the song was playing. And it, it's like this psychological message just telling me to let it go. The, the lyrics, would just, it says, let it go so many times. And it was like I had this message from my brain just telling me to let it go. And I listened to the song from start to finish, and by the end of the song, I was calm. That's the magic of music. And I have songs playing in my head probably 24-7 anyway. Even when music's not playing, I have music in my head. Strange mm -hmm. child. That's okay. That's okay. Now, here's something that, you know, I wanted to men ask about, you know, staying power. You know, <laughs> that quotation, staying power, meaning, you know, weathering through good, bad, and indifferent and being able to get through moments of hardships and seeing, I'm not talking about COVID, I'm talking about. No, just anyway, financial recession, change, popularity, yeah, changing change of the, the guard. guard. 
Tell us, my dear. No, I read an interview. It's a really good interview. I think it's the cover interview of the last issue of DJ Magazine. And Todd Edwards is, was on the cover. And I read his interview. And he said, nobody tells you how to negotiate the moment when you fall out of favour. And it will come and it will come and it will come again. Because this thing, music, is cyclical. You have maybe three to seven years. Once you get popular, and it's at different levels, you know, it's cyclical at each different level. So for AAA list DJs and even for Z list hobby, you know, whatever, you will find it has its cycles where you'll get lots of work. And it will roll and it will be fantastic and you everybody's asking you and it will be fantastic and everybody's asking you and it will be fantastic. And then guess what happens? Either the head of music at the radio station changes, the bookers at the club change. Oh, that happens all the time. <laughs> the bookers change, your management changes. One morning you might wake up and just not be enjoying the music that you're playing anymore and you might want to change it, which is what happened with me. And the people that are around you don't want you to change at all. So what do you do? You know, and for me, there have been probably two or three key points since 1994 to 2021 where I've had to really reassess how I do what I do and whether, I, you, you know, just try and figure out how, how I'm going to sustain a career. Now, for most people, they would say, oh, well, you know, the best thing you can do is to make music, be a producer. Yes, be a producer. It's true. Yes, do that. But it's still going to come. Those cycles will still come, whether you're a producer, a DJ, a radio presenter, those cycles will still come. Just because you make your own music isn't going to inoculate you against the, you know, the, the, the vagaries of, of, of public taste and opinion. You know, just that's what happens, you know, tastes change so how do you you know how I have managed to um surf those waves is one you have to remember where you come from always have to keep that foundation because that is the thing that will always keep you solid if you remember how it started you will you will always be able to find your, you know, your base level, your ground zero. You've got to know what that is. And then over and above that, you have to make that base level relevant in some way <laughs> as the years go on, you know, so you can keep hold of the roots of it, but you've got to find some way or some thread that will bring it up to date. And that's how I've done That's it. not easy. That's not easy to find that thread for many. No, mm -hmm. that's how people drop off. That's how people drop out because it's hard. You know, it, it, one, you've got to take the nose. And I have a postcard on my wall with like, it's got, it's one of those cards where it pitches and change like a 3D and it's got 50 yes on it and one no and then it's when you turn it it's got 50 no's on it and one yes <clears throat> and it's just to remind me that you know for as many times as you can think you're right and you're going there will always be a no there will always be someone that will say you know not good enough not my flavor not my type not my high size shape whatever and then there will always be you know in amongst a world of no's 
it only takes one yes to flip you back into that vibe of, yeah, okay, I understand myself now. One person gets me, I can go on with my day and I can rebuild this. And that's that's how it works, really. That's how it's worked for me. Good. Thank you. I'm glad because I'll tell you, man, when you're hot, hot, and when you're not, not, oh, it's such a horrible feeling. What is that? Is it a uh, is it Thelma Houston record? When you're hot, you're hot. Or Linda Clifford. Linda Clifford, I think it is. When you're when hot, you're hot. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, Shannon's for Clayton. Da, 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 I thought it was smack dab in the middle when you're hot, you're hot. That's Janice McLean. Yeah. Yeah, I'm smack dab in the middle. Yeah. And that's a terrible feeling. Look, people don't understand this that you could be in the room when you're hot, everybody's at you. Yeah. You could be right there and no one sees you. Yeah, you're right? invisible. You're invisible. People will look over you. You know, I've had people that I've worked with for two years and very famous DJs that I've worked with for for two years, that when my star was on the descendant, that looked to me, literally looked me in the face and said, didn't I see you at a conference somewhere? I'm like, I worked with you for two years. And you just like totally blanking me. But that's how it works. You know, we all know it is brutal. The music industry is brutal. And like you say, when you're hot, you're hot. And when you're not, you might as well be invisible. So how do you get past the invisible bit to make yourself visible again? And that takes work. That is the work. (laughs) Damn right it's the work. It really is. It always is like that. I mean, we've all experienced it some way or another in our lives. Something all of us experience. That's what makes you, what didn't kill you made you stronger, basically. Everyone, you know, I found it very inspiring that in his cover interview, Todd Edwards said the same thing. Nobody, absolutely nobody prepares you for that moment when you go from being the hottest thing in the world to nobody remembers your name. It happens to us all. It cycles. Oh. It happens to everybody. It happens to everybody. You know? How do you tackle social media? How do you deal with it? So, somebody Coming else asked me this the other day. I actually really, and I, I, I know I should, probably shouldn't say this, but I don't like social media. I really don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy it. It really puts a stress on my mental health. I think it makes me feel, well, nothing can make you feel any way. It's like my reaction to being on social media all the time. But it makes me Or I find myself looking at people and comparing myself to people that I shouldn't be comparing myself to. Their life is their life. My life is my life. My work is my work and their work is, you know, wherever. I really shouldn't be watching DJs who are AAA, quadruple A-listers who have beautiful palatial houses and playing to whatever and private jets this and fashion thing that I shouldn't be comparing myself to that but unfortunately when you you are promoting a party you have to do it you have to do it and you have to do the same thing that they're doing and it's like but I've only got like (laughs) 7,000 you know 8,000 followers on Instagram and I'm feeling like I'm you know and then I'll watch somebody I think it was Annie Mack who put out the post that had she had more reactions on this post than I've got followers on Instagram <laughs> well don't forget she's also a bit, she was also she's, massive. she's way, way way bigger than I will ever be radio so. one for years so I mean 
way she bigger than I will ever be. I understand that, but it but doesn't I know what you mean. stop you as a DJ reading that and somehow trying to figure out where you fit in in that spectrum and feeling like you can't even compete. That's what I feel like. It's not that I'm comparing myself to and wishing that I had that many. It's just like at this point, I can't compete with that. (laughs) And it's so hard, you know, because that's what bookers expect from you know and and the amount of social media that we have to do you know for every event for every party you know it's like we want three posts and one instagram story and oh by the way can you make a little video just saying that you're coming it's like if i spent all my time doing social media i would never get anything else done but it's expected of you isn't it it's expected of everybody because that's how the... I didn't say everyone, my dear. I said you. It's expected of everybody. It really is expected of everybody. Well, here's the and- contracts of today, everyone. The contracts of today is we're booking you to be our celebrity DJ. But please, we must ask. And they make a polite ask, which is more like we expect. We are telling you. Expectations <laughs> are... Yeah. Can you get us over a promo video? Can you get us some parts that you're tagging us in? Yeah. Can you, can you, can you, can you, can you? And here we go. Yeah. Just working yeah. All day. And it's a lot of work, you know, that again, it's part of the job. And this was, this is why I say, and I say again and again, like um, the DJing is a job. And I've just seen that my battery is just about to run out and I've forgotten to plug my laptop in. Plug in your <laughs> laptop while I talk to all the children. I'm going to get I'm gonna get my The young children book. are going to listen to this carefully. <laughs> listen to Auntie Paulette tell you how hard this job is. Don't be fooled that you see us all smiling behind the decks. I keep always saying it. That's the fun time. It's getting to the gig. It's dealing with the promoters, it's dealing with social media. In fact, the social media side of it's been really interesting for me because to True House Stories, when I announce things, people are showing up on the strength of the announcements. We got the batteries, got power. The ladies got power again. Yes, I have. I was was power. God bless the power. You know, I was just telling all the children and listening in and learning from all this. um, You know, we're doing all this stuff. We're not being antisocial. We're being social climatic and very excited about what we do. But at the same time, trust me, Karen will say to me, Lydia, I need this. I'm like, I don't want to do a video. I don't want to go and Oh, you know, can you make an announcement? Do I really? I don't want to. I'm going to ask you, Paulette, you have to make an announcement about. Go ahead, Paulette. You don't really want to do it, right? Yeah. Do you know another thing about social media? It would be cool if I had a film crew following me around that could just get the right lighting, get the right, you know, if people knew how, if you live on your own and you're in lockdown and you have to do a stream and you have to make all these, take a selfie in. I hate taking selfies. I absolutely detest it. I'm really rubbish at it. I don't do pouting. I think it's really crass. Um, what do we do? Just, slow down, slow down. Let me reverse that for a second. What do you mean pouting? Like with the... Oh! <laughs> you mean the duck lips? Oh, I hate that. Oh, it's so shit. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. See, she's going to be such a child. She's going to be such a child. <laughs> she said she's rubbish when she doesn't prove it. No, but I, no, I, what... I, I just don't so... enjoy that. I don't enjoy that but part you didn't of the come you didn't come from the era where you needed to be seen. You already we were seen. Listen, we didn't even take pictures. Right. <laughs> Who the hell? Okay, let's even take it further. Who had a camera with them? 
We were too busy listening to the damn music. It's just like the it was all about the music. Remember, the only time I remember pictures was two things. Either the club had a professional photographer running around Snapchat shining, either the magazines were there, mm-hmm. or an out of town person said, I got a camera, can we please take a picture? Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. we didn't bring cameras to clubs. It just didn't work like that. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. So, I, you know, the social media part of it, as much as it is very much part of the job, and more and more of it is part of the job, I personally don't enjoy that. I, it, in, an, in another way, it puts me under a stress because whenever I have to do these things, I always realize that I'm on my own doing it you know I'm on my own in the house I haven't got somebody else filming it I haven't got somebody else taking the picture for me and and even you know when I'm playing DJing a lot of the thing I'm on my own and you never really see anybody else in the pictures except me and I detest that I detest it we must you must do like we've all done what you do is you set up and do the test run and you shoot a little bit and look back at it to see how the angles look and everything. It's the only way you get around it. Mm-hmm. Hey, even here, I've changed cameras since this show has begun. We're now at a really awesome camera, but my first initial shows, they look, they don't look like this. They look yeah. much better now, but it takes yeah. time. It took me yeah. time to figure out all the ins and outs. And you know what? It's trial and error. As you see, it really is. Patience is a virtue. Trial really and error. I mean, even as simple as, you know, the table that I have my controller on in the studio is really low. And I didn't realize how low it was until I started doing live streams. And then I'm like, I look like I'm in a hobbit house. <laughs> I'm like, why is this table so low? And I'd never realized the table was so low until I had to film it, right? So you saw the filming back, you're like, <laughs> it's just like, yeah, that thing is low. So I'm still, you know, I've got to replace that table. I know I have to replace that table, but um, I've not done it yet. But it's just stupid things like that, you know, with social media and streaming and and going live and and all of that that. It's the part of the job I enjoy the least. I wouldn't say I don't enjoy it. I do detest it from time to time because it's an um, it's an imposition sometimes. You know, when someone says, we want a video, and just some days you just don't feel like it. You can't turn on that. Yay, I'm really excited. You know, sometimes you don't feel yay, I'm oh, really excited. Oh, God, everybody I to talk to, it. listen, every DJ I talked to said the same thing to me. I'm not in the mood to do this shit, just like yeah. that. Yeah. But you have to do it. You know, everybody's watching, like, right now. What are we going to be like? Grim and brim. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. You know what I mean? yeah. <laughs> That's why I said, you know, I'm not playing the smallest violin in the world and I really don't do pity parties. I'm not asking for people to feel sorry, but you ha- kind of have to understand why it is a job as well. This isn't a hobby. This is a job. And those are the parts that make it. That's the business part of it. And the business part of it, I just. So, you know, some of those bits I don't so really enjoy. This this is a funny one. It wasn't funny when it came out, but I'm going to ask your feeling on this. Uh-huh. Did you get the memo like K-Class and all the other ones that said, since your industry is shut down, you need to be retrained? <laughs> Did you get that memo? Because I asked that question for a lot of people. Did you see that memo come through? You must be retrained. You know, this whole industry is finished it's like the government thought or think because they've not changed their thinking on it at all that if anyone works in the arts or the music industry the creative industries that their jobs it's like their jobs are a hobby now i don't know anyone 
any DJ at any level, you know, the, you know, definitely the level we're at, who has done less than 10,000 hours of this. And, and there's the, um, there's a quote or there's a, a, a stream of thinking that says in order to become a professional in any given discipline, you need to do minimum 10,000 hours, you know, repetitively 10,000 hours of whatever that discipline is, whether you're a surgeon, an actress, a musician, violinist, and I would say a DJ. Once you've done those 10,000 hours, you're, it's not a hobby anymore. You are a professional 10,000 hours works out. I don't know. How many days does that work I out? Just at? The moment you got paid, the moment that you got your first pound or shilling, you're no longer a novice. You are now a pro. Did that ever change? <laughs> 10,000 hours is like two mm-hmm. years of time. You, That's, you see, you got it. it's less than two years. It's 460 18 days. months, right? 18 months. Days, it's 18 months. So you have to put in 18 full solid months at 60 hours, minimum 60 hours a week. Mm-hmm. No mm-hmm. more now. What am I talking? 10,000 hours? Oh God. You're working like 80 hours a week mm-hmm. to make that, to make that cutoff. Correct. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, guess what? Guess what? We've all done it. We work nine days. We're not retraining. <laughs> nine day weeks, 27 hour days. Yeah, I don't know we don't get weekends. Yeah, we don't <laughs> get any days off. This is a job that when you're hot, you got to take every, if that means you're working seven days a week, you're working yeah. seven days a week. Seven days a week. So it's over. Because you're afraid. You're afraid it's going to go away. You're yeah. afraid it's going to go away like the Titanic. Far away. <laughs> you do not want to be on that last boat. You want to be on the boat that gets you home. You just right? reminded me of something. Right at the beginning of lockdown, I remember sending him. I was talking to Simon Dunmore, and um, he said, you know, how do you feel? And I said, I just feel like I'm on the bow of the Titanic looking at that iceberg. <laughs> and there's nothing we can do about it. Turn so, the know. wheel! Turn the wheel! <laughs> Turn the goddamn wheel! Okay, wheel ain't going. He's going like this. And the boat's still going like this straight. Turn the yeah, wheel now! Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean. You know exactly what I mean. So there Ice. you go. Ice, ice, baby. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I mean, the point of it is you just better learn to that's a like great, ice. That's a great example. I never thought of it like that. You're on the Titanic. You see the iceberg coming up. And, and you, you know you're hitting it. it. It's like a <laughs> slow accident. Because the boat's not going fast. It's going real slow. Yeah. And you're going, Christ Almighty, turn the wheel. Yeah. And and turn there's out nothing. Wheel, and the boat's still going straight ahead. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like your prime minister. Yeah, well, that's it. That, that's why I said it. I'm English, aren't I? That was what I was watching. The prime minister. <laughs> that was what we yeah. saw. That was what we saw happen in slow motion. It was crazy. But anyway. We've survived to tell and, you know. Oh, it's not over yet. So now let's now talk about the most important part. Because you explained to us your pre- presentation, you you know, how you came up in the business, mm-hmm. working all the record labels, did promotion, you did production work. You've been part yeah. of the whole, all the gears that make this thing called dance music. You even rebooted your operating system to go into 21. <laughs> <laughs> What, what's yeah. involved with it's this? in process that re- okay re- so 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 give us an insight of what this you know you had a lot of time to think about this mm-hmm. what, what's the process that you're thinking about that's going to make you relevant and keep shouldn't say make you but keep you relevant and also a brand that will keep you going through the next 10 years in a sense um there are a few projects that i'm working on which I mean, first of all, I've had to identify what my strengths and weaknesses are. And as much as I like making 
um, productions, it's not the immediate go-to for me. So that is kind of down on the ladder for things that are going to come for the next two years. But my strengths are definitely in radio. And there's things coming up with that, which I don't want to hex it. So I'm not going to no, talk about it. But, no. but know, there's, oh, let's there's, have a, there's a radio journey. And then I've been approached to write a submission for a book, which if I get my ass into gear, you know, I've got my my first deadline for the first chapter for this submission is the, August the 14th. So um that's 10 days. Yeah. <laughs> and you're an English major. Yeah. So yeah. wait, so what is that? Yeah, what is I've, it written, you I've have written like track. half of it. It's 10,000 words and I've written like half of it. So I've got like 10 that's... days to write 5,000 words. <laughs> How many pages is that in 10,000 words, would you say? I have no idea. I have no idea how that works in pagination. I, don't, I really don't know. But the whole, the entire book is 100,000 words. My God. So probably normally a book is, what is it, 100, 150 pages. So 150 pages, 100,000 words. I have to use my computer. I, I mean, I'm really... Maths isn't my major at all, ever. It's never. okay. It's an English major. She's grammatically ready. Um, she'll correct our grammar. She will correct our grammar. Divide, divide. Oh, man. Everybody's going, wow. Everybody's wowed about this. They're You'll like, wow. never believe this. You'll never believe this. Believe, um, believe. Tell us, believe. Hundred. Yeah. It's a bit spooky, really. A hundred thousand words. Um, divided by 150 pages gives you um, 666.666. Yeah, the one that's 666. That's freaky. That's weird. I Yeah, I'd have to write another freaky page. freaky deaky, everybody. Oh, my God. Wow. So, yeah. so there's a book. Girl, I'm not gonna ask you. The- it's not been signed yet. This is for the submission, so I've got to. I mean, I keep playing with this thing. Stop me. Um, it's at the early stages of suggesting it, but I've got the publisher already, and the submission is in process being written, and you- then it's got a whole lot of other stages before it gets commissioned but that's what I'm working on and once that gets rolling I have to listen to myself because once that gets rolling then the writing takes me back to the English major god that's a really good title for a book the English English major (laughs) Chico will clarify your grammatic issues (laughs) issues yeah <laughs> beautiful yeah so there's that and then there's podcasts and radio and DJing which I am um, you know I'm kind of working on rebuilding the profile after a year you know nearly 18 months off we've all got to build it back up again so that's you know a big a job in, yeah, it's a job, it's in, a itself. job in itself. <laughs> yeah. It does it, you know, none of this comes for free. None of this comes without hard work. None of this comes without graft. None of it comes without grind. It really doesn't, you know, and as many gigs as I've got at the moment, I've had to work hard to get on those lineups. I've had to work hard to get that work and that will continue, you know. So that's what it's Version 2.0.2.1. Power. (laughs) You know, people, perseverance, power right there for you. Yeah. I'm coming try. No, indeed. Say it is, it is. Are you, are you, I'll leave it with this last final. Are you happy with your current management? your team of people that are working with you? Well, I'm just in the process of changing. So I've got a new 
Um, we're go- kind of going softly, but a new guy, Tim Levy at Limbs Music, is starting to do my bookings. Um, I'm still with M2S on a non-exclusive, but we're going kind of easy and seeing what we can develop between us and and in a more directional and dynamic way than I've been um, managed and booked before. So are you see what happens. These, are you finding these days that you have to be more proactive, like reaching out to people to do this yeah. book? Yeah, and I think it's made I think it's made a massive difference in in the last year. Certainly, the contacts that I've made with, you know, I'm in direct contact with a lot of organisers and bookers, whether they book me or not for their parties. You know, I'm not always right for their parties, but I'm in a lot better contact with booking agents and promoters and organisers and. And that, and I think it has made a massive difference to um, the level of work that I'm getting now. Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> no, I know that. I know that. That's really that's what we were talking about. If we roll back in time in this interview about working long days, because along with the social media, you have to do fraternizing. Which takes Network. time talking and networking. You call it fraternizing in New York. Well, I like no, network. It's actually networking, but I like to we use call it, it networking. Well, you know, here's the deal. We're on TV right now, love. So I want to <laughs> make it sound grammatically. We fraternize on social media. Fraternizing. You know? So here's the thing. We send out networks. Hey, it's me. I love to be part of your thing. And then we see how it goes and hope mm. that with the bait. They lock in and they mm. want to grab you, and you're like, mm. "Oh, another booking locked." Mm. You know? mm. I mean, I've been lucky. You've got a hustle. It's a hustle, girl. Tell them it's a hustle hard. You're hustling day and mm. night, thinking of like, I, I, you know, when you said about waking up and having songs on the brain, mm. you're thinking about where am I going to get my next work from all day long, all night long. Mm. And, you know, if, especially in the light of what happened last year, we've never had to think of, if not that, then this. But do you remember at school, you might have done like quadratic equations. It's one of those things that I really remember in maths that I was actually really good at where you put two things in brackets and it's the X and the Y and the, the squared and the trig. You know, trigonometry, algebra. calculus, algebra. I remember it was, it was in the brackets. I went, oh, no. So we've never had to think about that in terms of our work. It's always been fairly straightforward up until this point. If somebody booked you for a party, the party was going to happen. You were going to go out there and play. You know, even if there was nobody there, the party was going to happen. But now it's if not that, then this. And you have to cover it, it, the, the work in the brain to secure a certain amount of work now is is. 10 times more exhausting because you have to make three or four different contingency plans for how it might work out if one of those pieces move you know but here's so. the thing at least thank god you're in the country where it's happening yeah i have to get my behind across the ocean yeah in yeah. your country then to play yeah. the algebra game yeah yeah and i we are very lucky like that for the you know, for as long as it's, it lasts and if, for as long as we can do this without it all, you know, hopefully we're, we are at a level where it's not going to blow up in our faces again. But people are saying there will be another lockdown. I hope there isn't. But until such time, we just have to believe, never give up. <laughs> And keep never going surrender. And keep planning. And never, never give in. Surrender. Never, never surrender. surrender. Never give up. Yeah, absolutely. That. <laughs> well, that's a champion of the game, everyone. 
Yeah, I mean, like Joan of Arc. <laughs> oh, no, they burn her at the stake, didn't they? <laughs> She's Joan of Arc of dance music. She's Joan of Arc of dance music. the wrong person. Um, let me find somebody that they didn't burn at the stake. But they did burn most women at the stake, so, you know. Well, any woman at that era, any kind of power was going to get burned. You know that. Yeah, well, oh, you were a witch. They drowned you or they burnt you. Right. <laughs> You're outspoken. You need to be quiet. You're a down. woman. Drown, burn. <laughs> wow. First name, drown, and then burn to stake. Terrible. They did them all. Yeah. Oh, oh no. But they'd actually drown you first and then burn you because otherwise the water would put the flames out and then you'd be like, God. Oh. Did you follow that Monty Python train of thought? Yes, I did. <laughs> I think we covered all spectrums Thank of the know. rainbow with you, my dear. <laughs> I ain't even started yet, mate. What do you got? What are you holding on to? What are you holding back on to? Oh, God. I mean, there's so much. You know, they, one of the challenges or, or a big challenge in this industry for any woman is being a woman because how you take up space here you know it's one of the most inspiring things that I've seen coming out of lockdown is how women are beginning to take up space and own the space for themselves it hasn't really happened before it's been very you know subtle now it's like, take that. Look at all the way. Take that. We're here now. You know, really, you can see and feel a very, very strong female power. And that is incredible. And I find it intensely inspiring because for the 28 years, of my DJing career up until this point, you kind of weren't allowed to do that. Mm. Why did so you it's brilliant because wait, now wait. it means... Wait, 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 Paulette, why did you say that so quietly? Well, because that's how it was, you know. You what do you mean you weren't allowed? Either. You weren't allowed to talk about being a woman in the music industry. You know, women really, I mean, it's still, I can't understand why it's still a discussion point, but it is still a discussion point. It should be. We, excuse that's me. What that's, why we asked you on. that's why we asked you on, because we wanted a, a woman's perspective. Mm. You know, mm. it's important to to show the viewers that it's just not the boys club. It's, mm. it's you know, it's everyone now, all for one and one for all. Mm. It's a lot of women yeah. talent out there now. Well, and now, when, oh, yeah, absolutely. When you started, they are smashing the boys club. But when I started, it was really and definitely a boys club. And I can think of all the different organizations well, that I worked let's, for. Let's clarify. There was you. Let's name them out. The women that around at the time that were playing around the same time as you in England. Me, Smoking Joe, Rachel Orban, Lisa Loud, Nancy, Nancy Noise. Uh, um, Lottie came later. There Six. was Joe Mills. There Seven. was Angel, mm -hmm. Mrs. Wood. Nine. Princess Julia. Oh, sure. Ten. Rachel Orban, did I say her? Yes, you did. Sarah H.B. Oh, yes, from Kiss FM, 11 Happy yeah. Jacks. I worked yeah. with her. Um, and most of them, most of the names that you mentioned have left us and been married, had children, and went on to different... Changed their careers. Changed yeah. their careers completely. Completely changed. Yeah. So Gone. still doing it. Lisa Loud's still doing, doing it. it. Yeah, Lisa Loud's still doing it. Nancy Noyes is still doing it. Um, Joe Mills is still DJing. Smoking Joe, definitely. Have I said her twice? Probably. Um, but a lot of the OGs have dropped out. Hell yeah. So you have to take a bow. So now for the new guard, you know, you've got, I mean, they, 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 it's like a bouquet of names now. 
you know, whether you're thinking of Jada G or, or um, you know, Afro Deutsche or um, Jam Supernova or, um, oh God, who are those? Sarah Story. There's, oh, there's so many. Marcia Carr still. Yeah, Marcia Carr. Oh, yeah, she's going strong. Mm-hmm. God bless her. She just got over COVID. I remember she I know. Lord help her. We I know. It's the second time she's done it. Yeah. It's like, whoa. Mm. Whoa, resilient. Mm. Well, we wish you the greatest successes, endeavors that you step into. Thank you. You, know you, got, a plate, you got a full plate ahead of you, girl. I've got loads coming up. I mean, this weekend I'm in Brighton for the He, She, They party in the park, part of Brighton Pride. I'm in Warrington for Riff Fest on Friday with Graham Park and Will Tramp. And then the week after, I'm doing this big thing, 5G, big performance thing with Beatport and EE, which is parallel, which is going to be amazing with Chris Massey, Gina Breeze, and Hot Since 82 headlining that party. And then I've got the We Out Here Festival. I've got XOYO, Metropolis, Jazz Cafe. Um, Just check me out. I am smashing it out there on the really one too. I've got a lot coming up. There's there's so much, you know. They they. I worked hard last year, though. I really did. I I think I worked harder last year than I've ever worked in my life, and I didn't earn a penny doing it. But <laughs> <laughs> you're really funny. You know that. I don't think you're the only one that actually worked it hard and didn't earn a penny. Nobody really <laughs> was earned. It was a to tap on. There wasn't anything to earn from. There was no money turning around. You know, it was, Listen, all, it was be, all running on the fumes of the love. Truth, <laughs> the truth be told, the thought process was, are we? it wasn't even a financial thing. It was, am I going to survive COVID? That yeah. was what was everybody's thought. Yeah. Am I forget about to go? going to make money. Forget about going to party. Or the, it was, am I going to survive this? Yeah. You know, it's, that was initial. Yeah, As yeah. it went on, of course, we started to develop into different, you know, lanes of things that we were going to be doing. Am I going to live stream? Am I going to play in a bar to know people who can't dance? Am I going to, you know... <laughs> It's been the most bizarre trajectory, but um, yeah. <laughs> see, such a life. At least we can laugh about it in hindsight. Yeah. We yeah. still have some more grafting to do. I know you do. So much more. So much more. I keep grafting. Everybody knows that I'm working constantly. You're working. This is what it is. It is what it is, everyone. All it takes is a number one on track source for you. For your for karmic me? records. A karmic record. No, I've already had those. No, it's more than charts. that. No, it's more than that. Track source doesn't bring you gigs. Don't don't kid yourself. No, but I mean it gives you that moment that says, you know, this music thing, it does give you something back even even when you're not getting something back it's just to see that I'd success for an artist that you've you signed you want me to tell you the truth truth be yeah. told if you get millions and millions of streams on spotify that's like having a big humongous pop hit in my in my yeah how do you get a million streams on you gotta have a record that's super popular you know that's Uh, that's got the right algorithms and that's you know having them on tracks just we've we've done that you know i've done that with other records that i've had you know it's a great feeling but when you have a record that can go all the way yeah that's like having a a top 10 record in the uk on radio and you know (laughs) 